Hey everybody, Jan Bernakovich here with uh, Oregon State University Permaculture Design Course Pro. This is the spring and summer course and I do believe this is our sixth uh, Zoom office hours. Uh, we're going to go through, we've got a single question, we're going to go through that and then we may go through the upcoming assignments. So let's jump into it. So I'm just going to share my screen. We've got a question here from David. Uh, hey Javin, do you have any tips on turning a gravel lot into a thriving garden? Haha, <laughs> sad but true. Challenge, uh, challenge faced in my design. Yeah, so uh, kind of a short answer. Absolutely. Um, there's a great example uh, over in Victoria called Spring Ridge Commons, um, which was a food forest, is a food forest that was built completely on a gravel lot. And it was a gravel lot that was used for uh, the local school system to park their buses and generally the buses that were in disrepair. So they had oil that was leaking, fuel that was leaking, hydraulic fuel, radiator fluid, you name it, if it came in a bus, um, it was definitely on that gravel pit. And uh, uh, Jeff, um, forgetting his, his last name now, but uh, Jeff was a permaculturist who had been to Nepal, who had kind of traveled, had done his, his world tour, come back to Victoria and started to build um, a food forest, a public food forest there. And uh, a couple of the things he did, which was <clears throat> really intelligent, is he he built a number of layers of soil on top of that gravel. He also uh, took a little bit of that gravel lot and got a sense of where the water was flowing and then directed the water into some of those beds um, and then started to plant trees as soon as possible by, by digging out some of the gravel and, and just transplanting soil in and having the trees use that soil first and foremost and then start to move out from there. So that was one of the, the things that he did. I've done it twice where I've been working on gravel and we've done two different ways. We've either just like what Jeff did, we just built layers of soil on top, just moving and working with lasagna or hugels. Um, or we, we did generally the exact same thing, but we just contained it into boxes so that we had it looked nice and it was easy and all the rest of it. And generally, if you have gravel um, and it, it acts generally as a weed barrier or as a deterrent, then you have a much cleaner site, at least to a conventional eye, which I think for a lot of folks in Edmonton, that would be something that would um, be a pro if you were trying to get people interested in the site and working in the site, seeing clean lines, good signage, here's what this is, here's what that is. Um, just there's a lot of permaculture sites where you go and you need a high degree of literacy to decode the site. It looks like a jungle. It just looks overgrown and you don't quite understand it. Whereas when you're working with um, beds, when you're working with simple raised beds that are either hugel or wicking um, or just layered, um, it can be very simple for people to understand. And then if you have uh, an area where you can plant a tree and then you have an area around that, then uh, it tends to make a a bit more sense to the mind's eye. Now, David, if I remember correctly, your site is rather flat, correct? It is, yeah. There's not much water moving on it at all. Okay, okay. So one of the things that's interesting about flat sites, um, because we've we've got the ability, is that if, if generally they're flat and you want to... Um, generally... I'm just gonna I'm just gonna mute everyone. Hold on two secs, and then Dave, you can unmute yourself. Just getting some sound coming on. So where's my mute all? There we go. Awesome. Um. So yeah, if we've if we've got oh, I wanted to turn this off. Okay, there we go. Um. So if we wanted to build wicking beds and if we wanted to connect those wicking beds we could and generally the reservoirs within each of those beds would then be self-connected and you could fill them up on mass or you could have um, some kind of storage of water that would then through uh, a float pump could fill up all those beds simultaneously and this could be a great way to self-water that entire site the other way to do it would be to dig out some of those areas and then to dig them out and, and either do hygge cultures in them if they're gravel you can't really do much for the swale <laughs> the particle size is too large the gravel is too large and you're not going to get a fair amount in there so um 
I had uh, prepped this in Morfolio, and I, this is kind of a nice thing that I can show you guys because um, we don't usually talk much about programs. So I'm going to share my screen on the iPad. See if this works. Yes. Okay, cool. And then we've got Morfolio coming up. Great. So this is Morfolio Trace. This is a great architectural program I use um, for a couple of reasons. One, I can uh, I can create uh, I can scale this. So basically, when I brought this in, David, there's a scaling function, and so basically, I just put the scaling function on here. And you'll see that if I drag it over to the side over here, you're going to find that um, we end up getting a, a very accurate scale. Uh, but basically, if I understand correctly here, I'm just going to move to a different layer. There we go. Um, as I understand it here, David, uh, you know, all of this area here, this is this is generally all flat, correct? Yes, all flat, and everything in gray that you're coloring in there is is gravel on packed sand. Gravel on pack sand. Yeah, okay. So basically, we have to create um, organic matter as quickly as possible on this site in one way, shape, or another. So, generally, when we're taking a look at this, as I remember, these buildings as well are uh, they're set for demolition or are they being repaired or what's the deal here? Well, they're being inspected and, and that decision is pending. Okay. So, you know, I think part of this design is also making a case to spend a little money. I think they're salvageable. Mm -hmm. But that's you know a decision that the the city's going to have to make. Okay. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. Um, so thinking about that and having that as a potential idea, I might, you know, if this were I, I might start to think about well, how can I utilize this uh, rain flow that we come that we have coming off of this area, and how could I then bring that into the landscape in a meaningful way? Is this some kind of dry creek bed? Actually, it's a concrete structure. It, it was. It's on the old expedition lands and our uh, exhibition lands, and that was kind of a a little concrete creek they had set up to pan for gold, you know, as an activity. Okay. So it's it's immovable and and mm, not of much use at this point. There, it does collect a little water down at the at the southwest corner there, or southeast corner. So. Potentially, okay, uh, that can be used to gather some water. That's interesting. It yeah, is. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I might make the case that you know this is this is basically an area of potential water collection that we can use and we can put into productive use. And then again, depending on where entrance and exit is, I'm guessing this is entrance drive coming in. Yes. Okay. So, you know, if we're thinking about this in terms of what we might do here, you know, our, our zone one might generally be around this area uh, just because we have this area here. And then we may slowly move ourselves uh, backwards uh, into a zone two, into maybe a zone three. And so if we're thinking about up here being, let's say a zone four, I don't think any place here is gonna be a zone five. But if this is going to be a zone four, you know, what kind of materials, what kind of trees might we put here? Um, it, you know, it seems to me that we might do some long-term trees. We might take a look at a nut tree or two. Um, what are we at? 30 meter. Yeah. So, you know, our nut trees are going to be relatively quite large on here. But if we have this water that comes off, we may have the ability to take that water, put in gutters, send it to the north, to the north. Yeah. And then from there, creating or putting in some kind of hugel trench that then has a perforated big O pipe within it that takes that water and takes that in. So if we were to take a look at this in uh, in a plan, you know, if we dig down, I would say probably you know a meter and a half, especially if you're working with gravel, meter and a half by a meter and a half, put in that wood. And then put that big O pipe, perforated big O socked pipe. So when I mean socked, big O can come in a, 
uh, sleeved form. And that's good because it'll deter roots from growing into it. But say we do something like this across this landscape, and then of course bring the soil back in and put that soil back on top. Well, now all of a sudden we could potentially plant down slope um, any number of trees and work those trees into that landscape. So that way we had some, some further uh, trees on landscape or shelter belt on landscape. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be this close. We could also you know, create a small arbor, let's say that we're coming off of the, the building there. Um, we could arbor this out uh, if, we, if we were worried that coming directly off of this and then piping in would be a problem. We could also put it onto an arbor and then we could run that pipe across that arbor and then down. That tends to be a nice way of making it look so that way it doesn't look as, um, as, uh, as stark as it can be. And then we could take this entire area here and we could move it further north just to utilize that area. Mm -hmm. um, something to that effect. Uh, yeah, I like that idea. But similarly, keeping that, keeping that pattern, um, keeping that pattern as we move down slope, um, you know, hoogles that are coming across, the only reason I'm I'm defaulting to hoogles here is that this is a site that's that's gravel, and so you know, starting off, you start with these hoogles, and they end up kind of being these coral reefs where you can have quite a bit of growth around these areas, and then in between them, as time goes on, you might want to start to build uh, further areas or materials in them. And again, you don't have to leave a hoogle culture as we've seen here, where it's just a big mound, which again. Um, especially for funders, they see a big mound and they don't really see what it is. Uh, so if we're creating something similar, the other way to do this is then to come back in and put up your boards and make your raised bed. And then as you're coming in and filling, you basically fill into this area. And generally, if we're, if we're working with that big old pipe, that big old pipe is somewhere between two thirds to three quarters. Uh, of, of this total area that comes through here, uh, or the total depth, pardon me. So we've got something, uh, we've got that big O pipe that comes in and then we're mounding. Now remember, <clears throat> hygge cultures will lose somewhere between 40 and 60% of their height uh, between the first three to five years. And once that settles, um, that's what you're looking at. So I generally build these quite tall and high and they look weird in year one. But in year two and year three in particular, um, they end up usually coming right down to level. So I don't worry about that too much. But I could imagine something like that across these areas um, and then trees on the downhill slope to capture that water lens. Because of course, what happens when we have this, um, when water comes in here, it starts to seep out, this starts to decompose. And then you get this little water lens that percolates here. And the nice thing is, is that these trees will eventually find um, find this water um, and help them to survive. You may need to supplement water in year one or year two. And that could be as easy as starting to take a look at um, having a little bit of rainwater harvest storage. I don't do anything smaller than an IBC tote, but for you up there, and if you can find funding, you know, starting with, you know, 5,000 liter or 10,000 liter, um, especially at the top of the site, um, because you know, generally it's flat, but I I, am, I might be uh, incorrectly thinking of it as like this is the top and this is the bottom, and we may only have like thirty centimeters that we lose over it. But um, there's that opportunity, and then the other opportunity, and I don't know much about this roadway, but most roads crown. So you know, if this is a yep. to a, usually what we'll have is we'll have a gutter. Usually what we'll have is a gutter and then a crown. So hypothetically, depending on where those storm drains are, there may be an opportunity here to do a curb cut and bring more water into site and use it in some way, shape or form. So mm -hmm. um, those are kind of just off the cuff ideas. And then we've got sort of a grass area down here. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. That's the only lawn area on site. Yeah. So you may want to leave that there as a place for people to come in and sit and have lunch. Um, yeah. If you are going to bring people in, it's always nice to have those sitting spots. Generally, taking a look at the sun sector here, uh, as you're as you're involving uh, the other sectors, you know if there is wind or whatnot, you may want to beef up um, this 
area around here just to give it more of a shelter belt feel and if there is one that comes in you may want to think about a shelter belt there or using this area as that shelter belt mm. um but yeah i think uh i think having a place if this is going to be a place uh, having a place for people to sit if this is going to be a destination for folks would be useful yeah that little shed's a nice little stand that has doors that open you can sell stuff out of it too so oh great yeah great great public spot um so yeah that takes a little time to to put together probably you know starts next season so what about a chip drop like wood chips in the meantime you thinking yeah yeah so that that's the, that's the other kind of immediate one is you just layer organic matter and yeah. then if you do need to plant something um and those chips are not decomposed yet um then you can bring in some soil and just have pockets of soil within the wood chips right yeah. into and this is more of that back to eden conversation where you're using wood chips to decompose over time and you could do that if you have if you have wood chips you could just use wood chips on the landscape over time yeah that's a nice thing working with the city is they have some resources and uh, they may have a stockpile that we can dip into totally totally yeah um not to mention you've got gold bar and you've got the decomposed biosolids there um there's just a lot of a lot of organic matter resources yep good that's helpful i like the ideas for sure yeah yeah any other questions about that no that's a great start i just wanted confirmation especially on the wood chip because that's something we can do this summer and then you know start doing the more detailed stuff next spring yeah awesome and then it, this is going to be through nate okay eh? uh no no this is um through the edmonton urban farm okay fantastic Awesome. Yeah, so we, we have some students over there participating, uh, but but it's mainly driven by the urban farm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Uh, Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. Just going to go check and see if we've got any more questions or... Nope. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share on this one. There we go. Bring back the old face box. And then... And it looks like all of our questions are answered. So I think what I'll do is I'll run through what's coming up and we'll go from there. So we're coming up to lesson six, uh, which is due next week. And this is the soil conversation. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna bring up the template. And you may find that um, the template looks a little different because we're starting a brand new cohort as of today. So it may look a little different. Um, there's a some small changes, nothing major, but uh, if you wanna go back and take, um, take a copy of the new slides, you can. I don't think there's, I think there's a couple of title page differences. There's a few formatting changes. Um, I don't think there's any new tutorials from Soil Down, so you won't need to worry about that. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, and this is something that came to bear in the last class, is that all assignments are due on that final due date. This is this is the one thing we don't have any wiggle room on, so you have to have all your assignments due on that final due date. And that final due date, again, I'm just gonna pop over to a course page on Canvas. Final due date for your folks's course is August 22nd. So all assignments need to be in August 22nd, 9 a.m. Uh, if they aren't, you'll have to re-enroll or um, have an incomplete course. All right, so first and foremost, and some of you may find this information and some of you may not. This is just part of this type of work, but you can think that this is the type of work that we go through every time we take a look at a uh, uh, a property, a design conversation, uh, doesn't matter. We're, we're always going through this process um, the same. So first and foremost is we're trying to find any relevant soil data. And if you can't find anything local, there is a resource within the course that has a um, global soil survey, which is very general and very gross in terms of resolution. Uh, which is a great place to start just to understand that there is that much about soil. I've got, um, <laughs> this is 
the Canadian textbook called Soils Illustrated, which is a brilliant textbook, but you can understand that, you know, that's the level of detail that I work at, but you folks don't need to, you just need to understand that there are indeed different types of soil classifications. Those classifications have an impact because of their parent material, because of their uh, ability to hold or to remove water. All of this has a potential effect. And so we're trying to find what that is um, and, and show those different soil maps um, wherever we may find it. So uh, for those of you in the States, there's the web soil survey uh, because it's very, very easy in the US for all the rest of us internationally, it's a lot harder. So I totally hear you. If you can't find it, just make sure to note, um, looked, couldn't find anything local. So went with that global soil, um, soil survey. Uh, as we get into the soil testing locations, what I want you to show me, and this is a great example from Adria from last semester down in North Carolina, we want to get a sense of if there are different soil classifications on that landscape to show those. And usually we do an overlay of microclimates. The reason for that is microclimates can be quite indicative of our different soil types. And then from there, you're going to show us where are your three different soil locations. And you're going to give us a bit of a sense of why you decide to test there. So what's the detail of the microclimate there? What's the vegetation? What are the images? What's the date that you sampled? And most importantly, what is the reason you sampled there? Did you sample there because you're thinking of growing there? Did you sample there because you're hoping to build um, more soil? Uh, just give us a sense generally of, of why you did that. And this is a great way of doing it, of giving us a photo of that and showing us exactly where you where you took that um, that sample. So you can you can rejig that image and put that in there and then put in your map. Again, this slide configuration is a suggestion. It doesn't need to be exactly what you're doing. Um, you can change this, turn this into two slides. That's totally fine. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and copy the information from slide 80, microclimate, reason tested, visual description of the soil pit. So includes observations of any changes in the soil, color, things of that nature. Insert that site photo, which again, um, we're trying to get a sense of where that sample is. And then from there, we're going to do the shake jar test. Now, the shake jar test is not a hyper accurate test. It's, it's definitely not my favorite. The reason why we do it in this course is because most people have never seen that when, uh, when soil gets dispersed, it's it's comprised of three different elements, sand, silt, and clay. And we want to get it through students' heads. We want you to have a real life experience of that, that when you shake it up, it, it settles out with sand, then silt, then clay. And so this is why we take all the rocks out of that soil sample. We put a little dollop of, uh, of soap, which can help decrease the coefficient of friction. We shake it up really good, and then we set it down. Now, a couple of things that can change your um, your soil sample and we'll see if, yeah. So this is probably the best jar here. This is slightly not rounded, but you can imagine with rounded jar bottoms, you don't get a perfect volume uh, measurement. So you really want to find a square jar. If you don't have those, totally fine. I get it. If all you have is rounded bottoms, totally get it. That's fine. But if you are going to do this and really want to have an, an accurate um, result from the shake jar test, uh, yeah, go for it. So generally what we'll find is sand will uh, settle out, you know, within the first 30 seconds. Uh, silt will be 30 minutes and clay can be anywhere from 30 hours to 30 days. So if it doesn't settle out in time for you to make an accurate um, element or you still see this quite cloudy, just make sure you make a little note, say it's still cloudy, still settling out. We'll check back in a month or so. And this is one of the reasons why you should place it um, in a spot it, wherever you are or taking the sample that uh, it can settle out long term. Sometimes it's very hard to read these, which is another reason why I'm not a big fan of this. And I just don't carry jars in the field. So it's not something I do. So what we want from this is that shake jar test. We're going to get a sense of what's the different... Um, what are the different stratifications? You can, of course, do this in Imperial. Uh, if you can work in fractions, you can do it this way. Um, metric, of course, is infinitely easier because we can get a sense of uh, what is the measurement or the depth of this out of the total and then just figure out the percentage. Once we get that percentage, 
Uh, we'll start with clay. Clay is at the bottom here, zero to 100. This is 20%, so we go up to 20. Silt, 30%, zero to 30, 30. So 30 and 20 are gonna obviously give us this, which will give us 50, and sure enough, this is 50. So we're gonna take this little dot here, and we're gonna place it onto this area and show us exactly where that is. So image goes here, clay percentages go here, millimeters go here, or of course, inches. And then you place this wherever it is. Uh, percolation test, so you give us a sense of how many inches per how much time. So uh, we made the hole and it was 12 inches deep and it was half an hour. Uh, what's the feel? So we wanna get a sense of the feel of, of this material. So is it silky? Um, is it gritty? So gritty smooth, gritty. We wanna get a sense of what that feel is. What's the ribbon length? So there's a ribbon test, which I use in the field, which is for me far more accurate. There's information on this within the, the module. Um, and so basically what you'll do is you'll, you'll roll in the ball, you'll get a sense of it and you'll start to create a ribbon. That ribbon length really gives you a sense of how much clay and generally what the, um, what the texture is, the soil texture. And then the hand ribbon results, similar to the shake jar test, we wanna know if they're, they're the same or not. So, you know, you can look over on this one and sandy clay loam, but the shake jar was loam. So I would always default to the, the hand ribbon. So sandy clay loam, you know, it's probably a little bit more here and that's sort of the error um, that comes up with the shake jar test. Then we've got insert an image of soil uh, texture by feel, or you know you can move these around obviously. So here's the identifying soil texture by feel. This is a great way of showing it. The feel test kind of showing it on the hand here, the ball test showing what that looks like. And then finally the ribbon test. So you can see sandy clay, sandy loam, sandy clay loam. We're really close here. We're getting a good sense of this. Insert percolation test. So we get a percolation test, drain entirety of 12 inches of depth of water after 180 minutes at an average of one inch every 10 minutes or six inches an hour, which is great. And then finally getting a picture of the hole and a ruler just to see if there is any stratification in that area. So we're gonna do that three times or however many soil tests you have. So one, two, three, some people do more, some people do less. Um, you do have to do at least one. <clears throat> and if you don't have any soil on your site currently, um, you either dig to find it or you, you do a soil test with uh, like potted soil. Or if this is the winter, you, you do it with potted soil and you show us where you'd wanna take those soil tests and why that would be. And here's your example showing that you know how to do this. Then we get into a bit of the analysis. So what are some of the limiting factors of your soil type? So it could be compaction, could be lack of water holding capacity, uh, could be uh, quite rocky. Um, how do your soil samples compare with the narrative description of the soils on the soil map? So now we're going back and getting a sense of, well, in this area, we, we saw that it was prime agricultural soil, but because we're in the urban landscape and most urban soils are urban mosaic, it really doesn't match up. So completely different, which is very common in urban landscapes. What are some of the nitrogen rich greens or juices uh, in terms of soil building. So these they, these are materials that haven't decomposed or dried out. These are fresh materials. Maybe you're close to a grocery store. Maybe you're close to a lot of cuttings. Maybe you're close to a lawn that has to be cut down or, or, or coffee shop, you know, get those rich nitrogen uh, coffee bean refuse. And then what are some of the carbon riches browns? So uh, this can be cardboard, leaves, newspaper, trimmings. And what are other some other resources? So this could be some of our manures we find, or we could have some um, material that comes out of different commercial outfits like breweries. Um, breweries can be a great way to build soil quickly. Uh, my favorite way to build soil is to find uh, a horse, a horse ranch or stable, go out to the uh, horse manure pile, find the area that's been aged for three years. That's a nice way of saying decomposing. And basically cardboard goes down, manure goes down on that, straw goes down on that plant and you've got soil year one uh, because all that decomposition has already happened. Remember that with manures, some manures are hotter than others. So you know, chicken manure is really hot. We can't put that into the garden right away. We can't use that to build soil right away. Aged horse manure, fantastic. Alpaca, uh, llama and rabbit, you can use right away. You can incorporate it directly. This is one of the reasons why in a lot of developing countries, one of the first things we'll do is we'll create rabbit hutches because 
we can usually feed them anything and they produce meat out of it, which is phenomenal and more rabbits. So I, that's technically meat on both sides. Um, but their manure is fantastic. And so we can either take that or we can raise up the hutches, do uh, a grid um, uh, metal sheeting. <laughs> I've lo lost the word for wire. There we go. Um, and what's great about that is we can do vermicomposting underneath. And so the, the, the rabbits effectively feed, um, feed the worms. Now, of course, rabbits are legomorphs and coprophytes, which means that they eat their green pellets for second material. So there's always a balance, right? Sometimes you have to feed them more. What are the top goals for building on site? So, you know, here we've got expand existing compost system. When's that going to happen? Uh, what are the materials needed? So existing compost bin is module, purchase, purchase module to uh, attach to existing bin, add a Bokashi system, purchase list of supply, start mulching falling branches from oaks in northwest of property to add fertility, electric wood chipper, chipper existing. So nice to see if we already have it, things of that nature. And then finally, how is my soil building plan responding to the limiting factors that I noticed in my soil tests? Do I have the materials I need to adapt? So increasing, again, bolded highlighting is fantastic and use it in, in all ways you can. Increasing, let's just read this for bolded, just to get a sense of how quick this is. Increasing diversity of native plantings, wildlife, organic matter, water holding capacity, and threat of erosion. Immediately you get the sense of what this is. And this is why bolded highlighting, especially for clients, is so important. Materials needed are within budget and accessible, can be sourced or purchased. The primary limb factor is limited manpower. So at this point, and this was my my uh, feedback to Adria was okay, great. What's your solution for that? Are you going to create uh, perma blitzes? Are you going to invite folks over for um, work parties? Do you have friends that can come over? So those are all pieces we need to understand. So again, what are the goals? When will this happen? What are the materials and resources? Finally, we got back to SWAT, good old SWAT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So what are the strengths currently of the soil profile on site? Well, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of rock, which with enough organic life could be mined because um, that's one of the things that uh, microbiology does around the rhizosphere, which is the area around the root. It mines stone for its mineralization. What are some of the weaknesses here? So maybe it's very compacted. Uh, maybe you, you don't know a lot about soil and it's going to be an uphill battle. You're going to have to learn. Uh, what are some of the opportunities? So the opportunities may, might be, if I'm thinking of your site, David, opportunities are it's a blank slate. We can bring in organic matter. We can build it up quickly. People have really low expectations. So if we have any sort of growth, it'll look like a miracle. What are some of the threats, again, going on your site, uh, David? It's highly porous. So holding water on your site is going to be um, priority number one. A site like yours, you really want to be focused on how do we get water to stay on this very porous site? And if we do have areas that that generally are collecting, um, how can we work with that? Um, I just kind of had an idea about your uh, gold plan sluicing gate. Um, if if it hasn't, if you know, it's it sounds like it has a little bit of slope. You may want to muck about with creating little weir dams across this. So basically, in channel that have a little overflow, that have little areas that you might you might get to plant into or, or have reservoirs of water. I don't know if that makes any sense whatsoever, but I just thinking there, you know, you've got this concreted area and um, yeah, you could have like small little mini ponds all the way along, but that's food for thought at some point. Um, and then of course, uh, finally, any questions? You now, if you do have any questions for me, you put it in here. If you don't, you delete this slide. Any questions about the soil? Um, the so upcoming soil as assignment. Thumbs up from David. Okay. Any other questions before we we close out? All good. Thank you for the input. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody's assignments and we'll see you in the next one. Take care.